What goes up must come down. Gravity doesn't need an introduction. It's the familiar force that keeps our feet on the ground and our Earth locked in a stable orbit around the sun. But the mechanisms behind gravity are far more complicated than meets the eye. Gone are the days when we believed that an apple falling onto Newton's head represented just about everything there was to unpack about this invisible aspect of our universe. In today's video, we're going to break down five things about gravity that are often oversimplified, commonly misunderstood by the public, or even still remain just a total mystery. It's commonly taught that all interactions in the universe can be explained by the four fundamental forces. These are the strong and weak nuclear forces, electromagnetism, and gravity. However, you'll sometimes see these listed under a slightly different name. The four fundamental interactions, which is often considered to be slightly more accurate because gravity isn't exactly a force like the other three. To explain this idea, we need to start from the beginning. For over 200 years, the prevailing theory of gravity had been laid out by Isaac Newton. In Newtonian gravity, the attraction between two objects is described as an equal and opposite pull that can be calculated based on the object's masses and relative distance. The Earth pulls on you, keeping you tethered to the ground, and likewise, you pull on the Earth. It's just that you've got a lot less mass so that you don't visibly move the Earth. But maybe your mum does. <laughs> This model worked wonders. It was easy to understand and experimentally verified. However, even Newton himself was a bit troubled with one part. You see, he figured out how to measure and predict gravitational attraction, but he still had absolutely no clue what caused it or how this action could occur over such large distances. In a letter to Richard Bentley, he wrote, "...about one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else, by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one another is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophic matters a competent faculty of thinking could ever fall into it. The frustration would be shared by scientists around the world until it was finally resolved by none other than Einstein. In his theory of general relativity, Einstein revolutionized our understanding of gravity by showing that it isn't actually a force acting between two objects, but rather it is a byproduct of the way mass distorts spacetime. As you might have learned in a physics class, an object in motion stays in motion unless it's acted upon. This means if you are cruising through a vacuum in space, your speed and direction would remain unchanged until something affected you. Newton was spot on when he came up with this idea. Then Einstein builds upon it to explain his new understanding of gravity. In a Newtonian model, your path through space would be a straight line, and this straight line would be bent by a gravitational attraction curving your path toward the object as you are pulled in its direction. What Einstein did is he showed that it isn't really your path through space that is curved, but rather space itself. And this may seem like a pointless distinction to make, but it's actually really rather important. Mass bends and stretches spacetime, and as a consequence, what you perceive as a straight path is curved along this warped terrain, moving you toward the attracting mass. This straight yet curved path is called a geodesic, and it's easier to understand with a comparison to passenger airlines. Airplanes want you to take the shortest route to their destination, which is a straight line. And from the pilot's perspective, they indeed take off and fly straight with no deviation. However, when you zoom out, you can see that their overall path was actually curved because despite the surface of the Earth being two-dimensional, it curves into a third dimension on the surface of a sphere. And thus, what they perceived as a straight line followed this curve. It's a bit harder to visualize this in three dimensions because we live in three dimensions ourselves, but the concept is similar. Objects travel in a straight line guided by the curves of space-time. This gives the impression that there is a mysterious force pulling a distant planet toward a heavy star, but in reality, there is no force, no invisible push or pull that is shoving the planet in a new direction. It is simply a consequence of the star's mass warping space-time. And on a more advanced note, if we weren't there already, it's not just about mass. The distortion of space-time is actually created by any form of energy density, which is why even though photons are generally believed to have a rest mass of zero, they still interact with gravity, and you can even technically create a black hole out of enough radiation focused in a small region in space. And really, what you've just heard is truly just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how curved space gives rise to gravity. We won't get into deeper details, but we will leave you with the best explanation of it all. A quote from legendary theoretical physicist John Archibald Wheeler, who simplified the whole concept in the single phrase, Space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve.
General relativity refines Newton's findings and provided us with our most accurate model of gravity to date. However, it is not perfect and has one glaring issue. Of the four fundamental interactions, gravity is the one that has yet to be reconciled with quantum mechanics. Put simply, relativity is used to describe larger objects and quantum mechanics is used to describe the universe on a subatomic level. So, when working in the domain of one, usually you can safely ignore the other because they describe such different aspects of the universe. However, there are times when we can't just ignore one of them and need both an understanding of quantum mechanics and gravity working together to fully describe what's going on. This is the case in the highest levels of energy, such as the moments immediately following the Big Bang and near the smallest regions of space, such as near the singularity of a black hole. If we truly want to understand every aspect of the universe, these two will eventually need to find common ground. This has led to the decades-long search for a more comprehensive theory of quantum gravity or, in other cases, a so-called theory of everything that unifies all domains, gravity included. Without getting into the specifics here, there have been many different models put forward over the years, such as loop quantum gravity, M-theory, string theory, twister theory, and several others. But one problem that they all share is that because they are all predicting results on these extremely high energy levels or tiny, tiny regions of space, they are next to impossible for us to verify with real-world experiments using current technology. For example, loop quantum gravity predicts that space-time is not continuous and smooth, but is actually made of distinct pieces or bits that can't be divided further. As a result, this theory makes the shocking prediction that the speed of light is not constant, but rather varies ever so slightly depending on a photon's wavelength, with higher energy photons moving slightly slower. However, this difference is so indescribably tiny that we really have no hope of detecting it. Likewise, for several predictions of string theory, our particle accelerators simply can't reach the levels of energy required to either prove or disprove the prediction. Still, that's not to say that these theories are simply numbers on a chalkboard. Even without experimental validity, they still have yielded interesting scientific and mathematical contributions. It's just that without observable evidence, they can't yet be solidified as accepted science. And as a result, there is no consensus in the scientific community concerning quantum gravity, and the field is currently developing at this very moment. It's certainly something to look out for in the coming decades, as fresh ideas and technological improvements increase our experimental capabilities, and we finally might be able to crack the case for good. One of the most famous findings of Albert Einstein is the relationship between energy and mass, summed up in the equation E equals mc squared, where E is energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light. However, the value c isn't just the speed of light, it's actually just the fastest possible speed in the universe at which anything can travel, including light, massless particles, and even information. Crucially, when Einstein formulated his theories of relativity, he found that this cosmic speed limit also applies to gravity, implying the existence of gravitational waves that ripple outward through space-time. When there is a change of energy density, say if our sun were to suddenly disappear without a trace, the Earth would remain in its current stable orbit for another eight minutes without any clue that the sun had just vanished, because that's how long it would take for the last gravitational waves to reach us. But Despite his prediction of the existence of gravitational waves well over a hundred years ago, they were so small and difficult to directly measure that scientists at the time doubted if there would ever be technology precise enough to detect them. Fortunately for us, that technology does exist, and in 2015, scientists announced the first ever direct detection of gravitational waves using the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO. LIGO is one of the most delicate instruments ever created, comprised of two long tunnels in an L shape with an array of carefully constructed lasers and mirrors inside. The idea is that if a gravitational wave of sufficient strength moved through the system, it will ripple through and, for a brief moment, make one of the arms slightly longer and the other slightly shorter. This can be detected because the laser inside the machine is split into two beams that then bounce back and forth nearly 300 times in the separate arms before recombining back in the center. Because the beams are the exact same length and arrive at exactly the same time, when they collide with each other, they are completely destroyed by interference. However, if a ripple of a strong enough gravitational wave comes through, stretching the arms of the detector ever so slightly, it will disrupt the timing of these beams so that they don't perfectly recombine at the center as expected, and instead of destroying themselves, some energy will be left over and detected. It's obviously 
far more complex than that in reality, because scientists also have to account for background interference of things like the Earth and the Sun, but that's the basics of it. To understand it on the simplest level, if space-time is nice and calm, the lasers will destroy each other, and an indicator stays dark. But if space-time is messed up, some energy from the lasers survives, and an indicator lights up. Detecting this minuscule change is a process so extremely precise that it's hard to even put it into perspective. The arm of the LIGO detector, the long tunnel through which the lasers travel is four kilometers in length or two and a half miles and a strong gravitational wave will change the length of this arm by smaller than the thousandth of a diameter of a proton on the official LIGO website, they compare this change to measuring the distance to the nearest star, 4.2 light years away, to the accuracy of the width of a human hair. It is simply incredible. In 2015, after getting some modernized upgrades, the detectors gave the first indication that a gravitational wave had been measured, with the main terminal giving off a short, audible chirp. The tiny beep not only earned several people a Nobel Prize in physics, but was also evidence that Einstein had indeed been correct over a hundred years ago, long before the technology was around to pull off an experiment like this. To determine where these gravitational waves had originated from, a joint effort was launched across the astronomical community, combining the findings of LIGO with sky surveys and gamma ray detections. To give them a head start on their search, though, scientists at least knew what general part of the sky to start looking in because the waves had been detected by two separate LIGO systems in the United States, one in the state of Washington and one in the state of Louisiana. Because the waves traveled at the speed of light, there was about a 7 millisecond delay between the two sites, giving researchers a general direction of the source. There is one other gravitational wave system on Earth that is believed to be sensitive enough to detect it, and that's located in Italy, but unfortunately this third one was shut off and undergoing maintenance during the event. The consensus is that the origin of the waves was the merging of a pair of binary black holes each around 30 times the mass of our sun, most likely located about a billion light years away in the direction of the Magellanic Clouds. And remember, because these gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, the actual event that created them happened in the distant, distant past, long before vertebrates had even evolved on Earth. Perhaps the strangest of Einstein's predictions are those related to time dilation. There are two types of time dilation, one that arises as a result of velocity, and one that arises as a result of gravity, which is the one that we could be going over today because that's what this video is about. Gravitational time dilation is a crazy concept that our brain just isn't wired to understand intuitively, but we'll do our best to break it down for you. According to relativity, the closer an observer is to a gravitational source, the slower time passes for them relative to an observer that is further from the gravitational source. This means that technically a person living on the surface of the Earth would age more slowly than someone living on the Moon because the person on Earth experiences a stronger gravitational effect, though oh, when we're talking about time dilation with things like the Earth, the difference is absolutely tiny, mere fractions of a fraction of a second over a human lifespan. However, it is interesting to note that because the strength of gravity is much stronger at the center of the planet, if you had some stopwatches running from the moment the Earth formed, you'd find that its core is about two and a half years younger than its surface. Time dilation was displayed perfectly in the movie Interstellar, where one hour spent on Miller's planet is equal to seven years spent back on Earth due to the fact that Miller's planet is in close proximity to a large black hole. The time dilation caused by this black hole is also how the main protagonist ends up younger than his own daughter by the end of the film. Confirming time dilation experimentally was only limited by the accuracy of clocks, which improved greatly throughout the 20th century and led to multiple confirmations of Einstein's theories. Even the simplest of experiments yielded the expected results, such as placing one atomic clock at sea level and the other on the top of a mountain. If your clocks are accurate enough, you'll find each and every time that the clock taken to the higher elevation ticks a fraction of a second faster. Now, it's easy enough to take this at face value and move on, but a bit more analysis is needed to truly understand the why of this. The key here is remembering the time half of space-time. According to Einstein, the two are inseparable. When a large mass stretches and distorts space-time, it is also stretching and distorting time, which is what causes the difference in how quickly time passes. Think of time like a one-way road, on which you're always driving forward at a constant speed. Now, imagine that every mile there is a sign indicating that one year has passed. A pair of twins will go their lives passing by these miles
star markers at the exact same time, reaching ages 5, 10, and 20 simultaneously because they both live on the surface of the Earth and their roads of time are identical. Now picture the one of the twins is teleported near to the event horizon of a black hole, a place with immense gravitational force compared to the Earth. In this environment of intense gravity, the road will be stretched and lengthened, making the distance between each mile longer than those of his twin back on Earth. This means that even though they are moving forward through this time road at the same speed, the twin near the black hole has more distance to cover in order to age a single year, and thus it takes longer compared to his twin on Earth, and he ages more slowly. Still, the point of relativity is that each twin doesn't notice a difference in the passage of time on their own. For each individual observer, time appears to pass at the normal rate, and time dilation is only noticeable when you compare two different locations. The Einstein field equations are a group of equations published as part of general relativity that describe the geometry of space-time. Only a few months after they were published, in 1915, Karl Schwarzschild found a peculiar solution to them. A point in space where when matter reached a certain density, some of the terms of the field equations became infinite. Today, we know this as a singularity, around which the force of gravity is so strong that not even light can escape, creating the infamous black hole. You could fill a library of books dedicated to understanding black hole singularities and the strangeness that occurs at such high levels of gravity, so we're going to go through just a few things that most people aren't aware of. For starters, the popular perception of black holes is that they suck matter into them as they move around the universe like a hungry cosmic vacuum cleaner. But that's not true. As long as you haven't crossed the event horizon, the point of no return, the gravitational pull exerted by a black hole is no different than the gravity exerted by any other object of that size. For instance, if you were to replace our sun with a small black hole of the exact same mass, the planets would continue orbiting as usual, as if nothing had changed. Of course, our planet would become inhospitable without the warmth of the sun, but the point is that we wouldn't suddenly be sucked into the center of the solar system and eaten by the black hole, which is a very popular misconception. Instead, we would just keep cruising around on our stable yearly orbit. In fact, it's not just objects that can orbit a black hole, but even light itself. There's a specific radius from the black hole at which light is trapped in a perfectly circular orbit, balanced on the perfect trajectory to avoid both falling past the event horizon or escaping into free space. This point is called the photon sphere. It leads to some interesting thought experiments, such as standing in the perfect spot so that light bouncing off your head travels all the way around the black hole and into your eyes, allowing you to see the back of your own head. But in reality, the photon sphere is not only a one-dimensional line having no thickness, but also orbits on the line would be highly unstable, as even the slightest interaction would disrupt the perfect distance. Now let's say that you were trying to set up this little experiment and accidentally fell past the event horizon. Whoops-a-daisy. Most people understand that this is the point from which you can't return to the outside world, but let's break down exactly why that is. For every celestial object, there is something known as escape velocity. This is the speed you need to reach in order to escape its gravitational pull. For the Earth, it's about 25,000 miles an hour. For the Sun, it's closer to 1.4 million miles per hour. That's really fast, but it's still within the realm of possibility if you've got a nice spaceship with a powerful enough propulsion system. The issue with black holes is that once you pass the event horizon, the escape velocity becomes higher than the speed of light, and since we know that this speed is impossible to reach or surpass, you are now trapped. But it gets even stranger than simply not being able to go fast enough. Once you've passed the event horizon, space-time becomes increasingly stretched and warped beyond anything imaginable, to the point where no matter which path you take, the singularity is unavoidable, not just in space, but also in time. It becomes an inevitable point in your future. To understand this, think back to our analogy of the time road. When we discussed these time roads before, the length was infinite. All we cared about was how stretched it became under intense gravity. But once you're past the event horizon of a black hole and under the grip of its gravitational pull, space-time becomes so curved that your time road now has a concrete end, a finish line at the singularity. No matter which direction you face or how fast or slow you try to move, every single path you could possibly take through space-time ends with you meeting the singularity. It is inevitable. And it's all thanks to gravity.